Recall from chapter 4 that carbocations vary in stability. Tertiary ones are most stable, primary ones are least stable, and primary ones are so unstable they generally refuse to form when we undergo either substitution or elimination reactions. And the E2 mechanism is a way to describe how primary alcohols can undergo elimination reactions without necessarily having to form a unstable carbocation. But one big piece of evidence that such carbocations exist is the fact that they can occasionally rearrange and if they do so they are going to make themselves more stable. If we look at this alcohol here and if we imagine an ordinary elimination reaction you would suppose that we would only get the double bond at the very end of this chain because we've got this carbon with three other methyl groups it has no hydrogens to lose so we wouldn't think we could get a double bond in the middle so we would ordinarily imagine only one possible product which is the one way down at the bottom here but as it turns out we only get a very small amount of that about three percent because what's happening is that we initially make the secondary carbocation as we would expect removing this OH and having a positive charge there but instead of making the expected product, what happens is that the positive charge relocates itself. And it's more to the point to say that what's happening is one of these methyl groups relocates to an adjacent carbon, and that's called a methyl shift. So if it is the case that the methyl group moves over, then the positive charge is going to relocate, because now this carbon over here only has three bonds. So it's the one with the positive charge. But that's a little bit better for this molecule because notice it's tertiary. This methyl shift only occurs because we can take what's a secondary carbocation and now it's tertiary, much more stable. And with the positive charge being way over here now, that means we have two possible alkenes. We can form a double bond over here at the far left end. That would actually be this second product. Or if we take away this hydrogen on the CH group, that would lead to this product right here, the one we get 64% of. And we would expect to get more of this first one because it is tetra-substituted as opposed to di-substituted. But again, we wouldn't expect to get either of those unless that carbocation had kind of rearranged itself. Uh, such rearrangements don't always occur. You can't always predict when they're going to happen, but we can use that idea to explain results once they're obtained. And why in the world do we get double bonds at these locations when we would initially not expect to have a double bond there at all? So if we're told to be on the lookout for a rearrangement, again, it's going to occur in the sense of making less stable carbocations more stable. Either one that's primary can become secondary, or one like this that's secondary can become tertiary. This next slide is another example of that. If you dehydrate one butanol, you might expect to get one butene, and you do get some, but mostly what you get are these others. Because initially we might imagine a positive charge that would form at this first carbon is not going to be stable, but if that positive charge moves over to the secondary position, that's a little bit better. But this time it's not a methyl group that's moving, it's a hydrogen atom we say that this is a hydride shift that's going on because what happens is that one of these two hydrogens along with its two electrons relocates itself to the first carbon and so that first carbon now has three hydrogens and that gives us an opportunity to make either one of these two butenes instead of the one butene and again we get more of the trans instead of the cis because of the rule that trans uh, alkenes are more stable and form in higher amounts both of these are disubstituted, but trans is better than, than the cis. And we get, again, very little of what we would ordinarily expect that product to be if it were not for these kinds of rearrangements.